Hey everyone, um, I'm Jeremy. And so I'm gonna um, give a land acknowledgement for Misty and I, uh, while Danny is getting ready to lead things off. Uh, so uh, Case Western Reserve University, uh, and then also where Misty and I live uh, in Shaker Heights, we reside on the ancestral lands of the Lenape, the Delaware, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Shawnee, the Wyandot Miami, the Ottawa, the Potawatomi, and, and the other Great Lakes tribes the Chippewa, the Kickapoo, the Weya, the Pinakasha, and the Kaskaskia. This land of the quote unquote Northwest Territory was ceded under force from the US military by 1100 chiefs and warriors signing the 1795 Treaty of Greenville. And subsequently the treaty wasn't honored by the United States of America. Uh, and while I'm at it, Misty and I would also like to thank uh, Laura and Jeff McClar and their two kids. Uh, they are looking after our youngest Ellery right now while our next, uh, the next oldest is upstairs sleeping. Um, and thanks again, Anthony and everybody and Danny for uh, just so much for, for being here with us. Thanks, Jeremy. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know people are across the planet in different time zones. I would also like to acknowledge that I am on the unceded lands of the Darawal people in what is now known as Southeast New South Wales. You can see some of the rainforest behind me. I'd like to acknowledge elders past and present and to thank the traditional custodians of this land for their care of the multi-species relations that allows all of us to flourish here today. It's really lovely to be here with you. Thank you so much for Jeremy and Misty for inviting me to be in conversation with you. So we're going to start with some pretty general questions of each other about our books. And I wanted to ask you, Jeremy and Misty, why did you make this book? And I use the word make, which is a little eccentric when we're talking about a book, because part of what is exceptional about your book is the craftiness of it. It's a very material book. So I wanted to ask you about how you make the, how you made the book, why you made the book. And for folks who don't know the book, uh, a little bit of a sense of what it's about. Okay, I'm gonna, to have, um, we, 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 Misty and I talked about this. I'm gonna start with something a bit more verbal. Um, and then Misty is going to say a side that we'll probably get at the craftiness side, I would imagine. Um, so um, we said, Anthony, uh, that we would do something um, different, and and that's our plan. So I'm I don't actually want to talk about the book by by turning it into an object. I want to show the motivation for the book. So I'm actually going to start by um, reading some passages from Danny's book summertime. Um, and Danny, this is a surprise and that's part of it. So what I have are two passages um, from Danny's book about politics. And what I would ask is that people um, think along with them, enter into them and think of them um, with even just the word wonder with whatever connotations you have at this point about it. So I'll read these. The first is from um, page 71. It's during a part of Danny's book in which it is during um, the bushfires of 2019 to 2020 in Australia, which is the, uh, the main subject of the book in some ways. So it's now around lunchtime, and there are couples and families sauntering along the streets, eating gelato, buying knickknacks, wallaby tea towels, locally glown glass, glass vases, carved wooden bowls. Normally, tourists are a source of delight for me. Their pleasure is palpable and their presence and the desires they bring with them provide sustenance for the town. But today I see them through a film of bitterness. I find myself on the other side of a new malign fence. A man abuses me for leaving the dogs in the car while I run into the store to buy batteries for the emergency tor kit torch. The words to convey that I left the car running and the air conditioning on and that my pigs, Katie and Jimmy are dead gather in my throat. But his face is so angry and I am feeble. I stammer something vaguely defensive and get into the car. I see him return to the table on the footpath with his friends. The annual summertime ritual, a few days away from the city at the end of a long time poor year. 
At last there's time enough for late breakfasts and slow afternoons to read whole novels and sit at footpath cafes with friends, a house near the beach, a walk around the quaint village. The gap between me and all of these other people feels inestimably vast and I look upon them with a mix of alienation and disdain. Odd to find myself on this side of my judgments. I have lolled around on summer holidays too. I catch a few conversations as I walk down the street. I can tell who the locals are, even if I don't know them. They are the ones who aren't talking much. Their faces are turned down, absorbed in thought, and their steps are determined. From elsewhere, snatches of memories and musings on the present. Folks are spooked by the event of these fires, but, quote, Australia has always been a terrible place for bushfires. They're just part of the landscape, necessary for the bush to regenerate, end quote. I sense some anxiety, but it is sprinkled with analysis and indignation. Quote, radical environmentalists, a threat to the economy. It's important to stay sober, not to panic, end quote. Of late, my anger has been wild and violent. Today, it's gathering bile in my gut. I hear two blokes sitting on the porch of the pub bemoaning the fact that the greenies got in the way of the controlled burning that would have prevented the fires. I catch sight of the front page of a newspaper condemning the arsonists and calling for harsh penalties. This pleasure in righteousness and capacity to attribute blame is only available to those for whom the unfolding reality still remains abstract. The words taste like metal in my mouth. And so if you think of that as a background characterization of the kind of political environment many of us may know in one form or another, um, I'll also now just read a, a another passage um, to end this answer, um, which talks more about the, the stakes of where we are. This is from very near the end of the book. It's on page 184. Already as parts of the planet become too hot for humans to continue to live there or too volatile for them to live safely, Civilizations woven from millennia of connection to place are being mourned by people who carry away stories of worlds being left behind. The ubiquity of the climate catastrophes unfolding, not only here where I felt the fire, but across the planet can perhaps give us some inkling of how deep we're all in this. The killing has no boundaries. Everything is within its sights. Perhaps the term could be omnicide, the killing of all not just all humans, as if humans were the only beings that could be murdered, all beings. What would it take for us to stop this killing? How do we even begin to wrap our heads ar around its enormity? H how do we trace the complex roots of responsibility into all the places where they are dug deep into our politics, into our economics, into the ways we understand ourselves and everyone and everything else with whom we share this earth? Can we learn to tell new far-reaching stories about responsibility and do we have the capacity to put our names to stories that both recognize the unevenness of culpability and its concentration in particular types of practices and arrangements and yes also in particular people and groups of people and at the same time to acknowledge the ways in which we're all implicated and if we can learn to tell these types of complex stories how do we go about wresting our lives and ways of life back from those pathological practices in malignant institutions how do we learn to understand ourselves and everyone else, human and other than human, in ways that will help us extricate ourselves and those who come after us from omnicidal ways of being human? How do we attach ourselves to stories that have the power to woo us away from the spells of progress and the logics of extraction and violence that have legitimated the killing? Okay, so that's my indirect answer to why I wrote the book and made the book. We'll say more later. Misty, over to you. Yeah. Um, so to start with the with the question, why why did we make this book? Um, my part of it, uh, the answer to my part of it is that Jeremy invited me to. Um, that when he began the process of writing on wonder for this book, um, he asked me if I would be interested in. Um, creating images to go alongside it. Um, and I said yes, because I was interested in um, something that, that we had talked a lot about in our relationship in 
thinking together or thinking alongside each other. Um, and, and also thinking about, um, about wonder, thinking about how we experience the world um, at the beginning of the life of our son, Emmett, um, who at this point was only a couple of months old. Um, and, and then kind of having our creativities um, overlap and weave together in whatever way um, they would do that um, for us as partners and also as parents and um, also as a family of three. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's my full answer. By way of response, uh, so that was a total surprise to me that you were going to do that. But that said, I think, again, in form as opposed to just in content, it performs very much of what you're doing in the book, which is a permeability and an openness to the other that, that so much of the book is not the author speaking but an invitation to be part of this curious conversation. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a signal of who you both are in the crafting of the book. And if I may, I'm going to respond with some of your passages that spoke really strongly to me. Uh, for those of you who are yet to enter the, the, the book, Jeremy and Misty's book, it's written as a musical score. And so, again, there's something very appropriate about the type of call and response that we've ended up in, not what we intended. So I'm just going to read three, three paragraphs from different parts of the book. What makes wandering different than other forms of thinking or attention, say, deducing, inferring, doubting, scrutinising, inquiring and the like, is most precisely this holding space around things for other, more connected, elaborated, transformative, and so on, meaning and sense to open up. Wondering is the part of thinking in which we hold space around the sense and meaning of things, receptive to how their sense or meaning may change by becoming deeper or more elaborate. Wandering over someone is reflective, personal, and vulnerable. I think you see the, the difference between that wandering over someone than the passage that Jeremy read of where, where we just see the other as an object who we've already decided is a certain way. Sorry, I go back to the text. This strikes me as much closer to the rich meaning of wonder than wandering at or about something. When I see another in their own right, I do not simply direct my mind at them. Sorry, my dogs also have something to say about it. Nor do I let my thoughts wander casually about them. Both do not take the other seriously. The first turning the other into an object and the second letting the other go blurry as if they were not the real source of consideration. Rather, when I see another in their own right, I take them into my world and consider them in their own right. Who is this one? How are they? In what ways do they unfold into the light? When wandering over someone, they become the ground of our world of sense. And the final passage, I really love this one, and you get a sense of the voice of the text here. I came to realise that my understanding of isonomy prioritizes honesty. In other words, the politics of wonder was taking me to a more honest politics. This was like water for my parched earth. We may think that the person who spouts off their reactive views on television or the internet is being honest, but they aren't truly concerned with what honesty means in life between people and how it relates to wondering. When we are truly honest with other people or inside ourselves, we must come to terms with our discussion, uh, with our discussion being able to get lost and sometimes with ourselves being lost. I'm sorry, but no human is God. 
our beliefs get lost somewhere and our believing something does not make others believe it so. So back to you. Thanks, Danny. Um, so just one other thing. Um, I, I, I didn't want to get too meta in this discussion as we're going, but um, just to signal to listeners who are used to a much more um, basically summary discussion of the book, discussion of the theses and so on. Um, Misty and I and Danny in different ways decided that we didn't want to do this. That, that if, you're, if you're really interested in this topic and in our books, you can go and look up the information. There's plenty of it. Anthony's put some of it in the chat. Um, but what we wanted to do is to take this opportunity to um, actually get lost a bit together around where our books interrelate. So just I'm, that's it. I'm not going to get meta anymore in this conversation deliberately because I think it's overly confusing. But I wanted to just signal to the listeners of the philosopher that, yes, I know that this is a little strange the way that we're doing it. And it's deliberate. So, Danny, um, the question we next had for you, um, I think before we turn into the realm of closer to images and, and maybe some more reading is just how, what, what is the story behind the making of your book? Um, how did you come to make it the way you did? And, um, you know, what would you like to share with listeners about it? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. So before I get to the book, I just need to say that I, so my philosophical work has always circled around questions of justice and how do we live well together. And in recent years, that has turned from what we call the sphere of human rights, which is concerned with how humans live justly together to thinking about all earth beings. So <clears throat> all humans, all other animals, forests and rivers and soils and all of this entangled relationship of life. And that's not just my day job. So a few years ago, uh, I moved with my partner to this extraordinary rainforest in the southeast of Australia. <clears throat> and we live in part of what we call an intentional multi-species community. So literally summertime came out of my really intimate encounter with what it meant for all of the beings with whom I share this life to meet climate catastrophe in the form of the black summer fires of 2019, <clears throat> 2020, how it was for the wallabies and the wombats and the kookaburras and the pigs and the donkeys and the river and the ferns and the soil and how it was for me as someone who was dedicated philosophically and in terms of my material practice to care for all of these relationships. Um, I had been thinking about climate change, of course, for a long time. I work in environmental uh, politics, environmental philosophy, but I have to tell you that I realized that until that point, it remained abstract. It was somewhere else to someone else uh, at some other time. And then when the Gondwana rainforest started to burn in Northern New South Wales, I realized that it was us and it was here and it was now. And so on the same days that we were evacuating the animals or I was feeding the animals when they'd been evacuated somewhere else or we were packing our house into a truck, um, I was very, thinking very deeply about what was going on. And it was out of that, that thinking through what was happening, where, where my body was with all of these other bodies that summertime emerged. And I really want to emphasize this. And, and this is my way of speaking back to your book that, that in our tradition, we are constituted as the author or the thinker. Um, but really, we're gathering places. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. So I just want to quote there's a there's a, a line in in your book where you say relating is a fundamental mode of being human, as central to our being as thinking and doing. And a few pages later, humanity is a name for the potential of human beings to connect with each other. And I would add, of course, others. And I know you believe that as well. So there's a there's a chapter in the book that I wrote about. Uh, lyrebirds. So for those of you in other parts of the world who don't know who lyrebirds are, lyrebirds are these extraordinary birds that we know of as mimics. 
So their songs are very place-based. They sing what they hear. So the types of other birds who are there and eat the particular type of vegetation that's there. And, and I thought of these birds as a gathering point. So they're a gathering point for what's happening in place. And that's really where summertime came from. It came from this, this gathering point of, of all of our experiences. So during the Black Summer Fires, all over the world, it wasn't just in Australia, it was everywhere that people were really shocked by the ruin of what was going on, not only to human civilizations and human communities, but to other animals. Uh, you know, I hate to just drop this figure in, but, but it must be there that it's estimated that three and a quarter billion animals were were murdered, and I say murdered as opposed to died because there was human responsibility behind their deaths. And that seemed like a real opening to me to talk not just about these, all of these other beings as kind of objects who are being destroyed. And this is really probably the most important part of the wonder in the book, but they were having an experience of what's going on. They were feeling their relationships were being broken. They were making sense of it too. And I don't just mean the sentient animals, I mean the ferns as well and the soil. They were very different types of experiences, but they were also having experiences of what was going on. And I, and I really wanted to try because I found myself at this place of intersection of being someone who had thought about these issues and someone who was now beset by the fire, I wanted to try and convey what that we're not the only, we humans are not the only ones having an experience of climate catastrophe. Everybody else as, is as well in their own way. And that when we realise that, on the one hand, that just overwhelms us, right? Because the sight of, of pain and the sight of terror multiplies extraordinarily. But when we're not in the place of catastrophe, it also opens up the world in the most extraordinary way to know that actually we're not alone. We're not the only ones who are experiencing. And there are all of these possibilities of friendship and, and world opening that you talk about in your book is what happens when we wonder over other humans. And then and our world making can happen in this much more capacious way is as if the it's you know thinking about Misty's paintings as if the the um the palette expands enormously and it expands even more mm -hmm. when we include beings other than humans so that's a I, that's quite a long answer but the book came out of all these relationships mm -hmm. so I felt that I needed to explain that um I wanted to ask you, Jeremy, I, I, I don't know if you want to respond, um, but I did want to ask you, so when, when Anthony introduced us, he, you know, he said that, um, that we were going to be talking about your book, and I know the normal format here is a conversation where there is an interviewer, which was originally what I thought um, we were doing, and then you said, no, you wanted the books to be in conversation with each other. So I, I, I really love you to, to explain, like, a, apart from being a very generous human being, uh, why did you bring these two um, pieces of craft together? Sure. Um, and then I think, I think we're, we're going to move into visuals um, toward the end of our time. So I'll try to keep this on the shorter side. Um, so just just to backtrack a little bit, um, and I, I, Anthony, I don't I'm not monitoring the chat because I'll find it distracting, and I just want to listen to voice and embody as much embodiment as I can. So sorry if this is if I don't know this, but um, Anthony, I don't know if you dropped in the preview of the interview that Misty and I did on the book that's going to be out on Friday with the American Philosophical Association for people who want a more a slightly more conventional. Um, way into the book, um, that's a good place to look. So when you go there, you'll find that there's a whole backstory to this book. This book actually emerged out of a long scholarly engagement um, that happened around the Human Development and Capability Association, 
um, in particular around the question of wonder um, over, as I would say, uh, Nussbaum says, in the presence of um, um, non-human forms of life. Um, this goes all the way back to the early 2000s. Um, so you can read about that. But as it developed, what happened with the book is, is that it became increasingly a response to a possibility that appears in Nussbaum's work, or it did appear, it, it still is it's a bit vague, but that appears in Nussbaum's work um, around her thinking of other animals, um, and only marginally, in, at least at first, in her thinking about um, interpersonal um, human politics. And that's the idea that even compassion, or as she says, sympathetic imagination, actually depends on wonder. And when I read this, when I, when I wrote an article on this to ex actually explain that this has to be the conceptual structure. When I read this, this is in 2006, or I, I actually, I had, to, I had to deduce it basically. But when I came to this conclusion and read what I had deduced and saw that the evidence was good, and I thought about it most importantly, tried to think about it analytically, um, it, 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 it completely stumped me. Because coming out of the Bush years, the Bush-Cheney years, the years of quote unquote moral clarity, where even one of my um, teachers, Susan Neiman, who's gonna be on uh, the philosopher later this, this spring, would, would, would try to argue for moral clarity on the side of the left, kind of against a conservative version of moral clarity. In this world, to talk about wonder, and what I later realized was getting lost in searching for sense and meaning, which, which I view as the, the life of wonder, um, that was just such a completely different vision of politics but it was one that was thoroughly relational and thoroughly embodied. And, it, it, and, it, and, and I just had to, I had to start writing on it. And then of course, we know what happened from 2006 to 2000 now, right? Um, and it just didn't happen in the United States of America, although unfortunately everybody had to deal with our insert, you know, swear word. And, um, and so th this book became more and more important. And because I had written so much about other animals already, there's all these, these scholarly publications. I wanted to write about politics in the more conventional sense, understanding that it would fit together with the other scholarly work on other animals. And so that's how we came to this book that's extremely intimate that Misty and I made. And I just wanna say before we, we get there that, you know, yes, I wrote the book, but that just like you said, Danny, it, it, that actually doesn't ring true because Misty and I were doing parallel projects at the same time and we were learning from each other as we tried to come to terms with the overwhelming experience of having our first child and of being in the middle of COVID and of having to deal with the aftermath of the Trump presidency and so on and so forth. So that's the background and the structure of the book you can read about in the interview. It's, it's complicated and so I don't wanna just simplify it here. But Danny, in answer to your question, the reason I brought our books together and asked Misty, can we do this? Misty liked it is that your book is written from your entire being. And I don't mean that in just a romantic sense. It's written from a set of practices that you have been embodying and living with a community and also an interspecies community for a while now. And then on top of that, you write incredible, I mean, you're a really, um, you're a really um, innovative and distinguished thinker in your own right, a political theorist, a social theorist, and a philosopher in that sense. And so you managed to write a book that can be read by everyday people and that has the quality of being in the world for real, not just the abstraction being in the world that comes from a bunch of Heideggerians. And yet in it is this very nuanced discussion of, 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 of the stuff we've already talked about, I won't repeat it. And so for me, I mean, that like it, you know, we can talk about wonder, but, but the whole point of, of a politics of wonder is to stop talking about stuff so much and actually talk together and actually enter into a world where we have to get lost together. And so that's, the, that's why I brought our books together. You know, I think you can fill in the gaps. It fills in an area of the book that I didn't explicitly focus on. It's written in a thoroughly, as I call it, relational or interpersonal manner. Um, and it's, you know, theoretically quite sophisticated, but open to people in a way that people can, can enter into. And so um, it just seemed like a natural. If I could, just before you ask, I know you're going to ask a question about visuals, and then I think we're probably going to be out of time soon. Um, can I just read another passage from your book that kind of gets at some of these things? 
Okay. So, um, so um, this is near the end of the book. Um, and so um, I'll, I, there were other passages I wanted to read, but I'll just read this one in the interest of time. So um, far more difficult, it seems to me, is the challenge of working out how to live together in ways that are both ethical and realistic. There can be no pretending that vast asymmetries don't exist, nor any denying the power we humans wield. But that does not preclude acknowledging our interdependence, our finitude, and our embeddedness in a world where there are myriad ways of being alive that we may encounter and also may never be able to understand. Far more difficult is giving up on the fantasy that Eden or its equivalent can be restored and being present to a planet that both bears our stamp everywhere and always exceeds us, a planet in peril and us in trouble. I've come to doubt the idea that if only we could identify the grand plan for recovery, we would then be able to construct a world to realize it. That if only we could ascertain the correct principles, we could then follow them and attain something like justice or peace or safety. My guess is that it is going to be far messier than that. Oh, my guess is that it is going to be far messier than that. More a matter of forging the track than finding it, definitely more a matter of collaboration than pioneering. The others with whom I share this home and with whom I shared the weeks of the fires have already taught me a few things. The donkeys' attentiveness to each other's signals and their shared responsiveness to the messages they discern from the other beings around them, the smells, the changing light. And my pig, Jimmy, generous being that he is, has come up to me on a few summer days and wiped the mud that covers his own body, with, uh, that he covers his own body with, on my bare white arms as if to say, hey, girlfriend, you're gonna get sunburned. A brilliant answer to the puzzle I'd been trying to solve of how to protect my white human body from the harshness of the sun without poisoning the river with sunscreen. I'm surely not the only one who would benefit from hours of quietly lying under the trees instead of locking myself in an office and writing about those same trees' marvelous capacity to lower temperatures and cortisol levels. It might not be a bad idea for those of us also dealing with ecological grief and trauma of the recent and unfolding devastations to visit the cool of the places that Jimmy built himself to heal. Oh, thank you. I have so many responses, but I'm not going to respond at all because I really want to hand over to Misty and, and some of your images. So I'll ask this question briefly. Um, really by saying that when I encountered the, the paintings, the images that are in the book, Misty, it struck me that they weren't representing something. They, they, they bore the mark of, of your experience of, of really encountering this new world that was opening up for you. They were more like verbs than nouns. And I just wondered if maybe you could show us a few images and talk to us about what it means to do non-representational painting in the spirit of wonder. Um. I, I'm, uh, I'm also going to throw the script a little bit and um, I'm not actually gonna show <laughs> my images, um, but if people wanna see them, um, I saw that Anthony did link my website and also um, they're you know, in the book, um, which is where they were made to, to, to um, be housed, I guess, for, for, um, as a way of framing it. Um, so, you can see them in either of those places. What I do want to do, um, Anthony, if I could um, share, screen share an image um, for a moment here. Uh, I want to show the work of um, an artist who I who I think is in the spirit of what we're talking about, um, uh, who really works to um, try to relate to other people through. Um, through the medium of uh, visual art. So um, this, this artist's name is uh, Riva Larere. She is um, a portrait artist, an art instructor, and also an anatomy instructor who was born with spina bifida. Um, and uh, you know, she basically began her studies in the medical humanities and then moved into art from a position of recognizing that um, 
medicine was not a space that she would be able to um, physically um, operate within. Um, and her way of approaching figurative work um, is to um, basically try to make it fully a fully collaborative experience where the person who's the sitter for her work um, has as much of a hand in um, how they're represented as she does. And so she, in, in my understanding of her, she's approaching visual um, representation through um, the inside of it instead of the surface um, in multiple ways by um, understanding the human body from the inside, understanding relationships from the inside, um, and understanding the experience of another person from the inside. Um, so I, I've been thinking of her when we were discussing images, um, Danny, because she she feels as though she is, you know, having this embodied um, experience where she's willing to um, to to get lost with another person and to lose her part of what it is she's doing in order to to use art to understand the experience of another. So I'll turn that off. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so Go Dan, on. I had a question um, to ask you and you've partially answered this already, um, but in reading your book, um, I was struck by the number of other beings present. Um, and I wondered how you thought about how to talk about them and their experiences. Uh, I'll try and answer that, brief, that briefly because I, I know we want to leave some time for Q&A. It's such a tricky question, uh, Misty, and it's one that that I think everyone who writes, who uses the medium of human language to write uh, with others um, struggles with. And I think of it as, to, to use a word from the quote that Jeremy just read, as trying to forge this path between exclusion on the one hand um, and assimilation on the other to how to hold this radical otherness but to hold it not to exclude it and you know for some people it, it, like thinking about Ed Yong's new book An Immense World which is just a brilliant book for those who don't know it where he he does it he goes through an enormous amount of scientific research on the umwelten of other creatures so how other species experience the world what their sensorium is so for some people that's the way in is this kind of scientific technology but for me it's actually much more banal which is is to be with to to spend time with to to, to literally there's a there's a, a passage in the book where um jimmy who survived the fires and his sister katie was killed uh he was not eating and he was not drinking and I was racked with worry about him and all I could think about was what I could do what we could do to save him and I went and sat down in Jimmy's world where he would sit uh, where he would lie on the cool earth and I had this experience that where he was placing himself you could hear the river and the, the breeze was moving through the trees and you could hear the birds and the earth, the cool of the earth came up into my body. And from there, I had to make a leap. You know, I felt like he was returning himself to this world that wasn't ravaged by the violence of industrial capitalism, a world where there was still a sense of connection and relationship but that came from like placing my body where his body was. So a lot of it for me is walking with them. You know, I, 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 we had some architecture students here a few weeks ago and I was saying to them, do you know how I do my research? A lot of the way I do my research is I walk around the land and I collect the donkey and the horse manure. 
And you're like, wow, that is a philosophical research practice. That's a methodology. Put that in, you know, in a paper as your methodology. But but truly it is because when I walk the land, I see where they have spent the night and I feel the earth and I'm intimate with all of the different uh, my, microbial life that is present there. So it's, it's, a, it, it, it's, you know, Jeremy and I met in this really, I don't know if you remember Jeremy, but we were at an environmental justice conference and we were in a session together in a room with no windows. And I said, I don't want to do, I don't want to do this. This is not how you do environmental philosophy. How that that I it would be like a bunch of men doing feminist philosophy with no women present. How can we do this so out of relationship? And that was the seed of th this relationship where our ideas refract through each other. So that's my answer, Misty. Is is I don't. I don't observe them and then try and represent them in the same way as, and please folks do look at Misty's images where, where you're actually on the inside of your newborn baby experiencing the world because you're there in the bath with him, right? You're there um, feeling out a relationship-based world and then speaking from that. So that's what I try and do. Of course, it's always a, an approximation. I, I think um, we're at time. My hunch is we're at time. We should let let open the floor for the three questions we have. What do you think, Anthony? I think that's sure, let's give it a go. So um, there's two related questions, um, one from Graham, one, one called um zooming and they both ask um about the linguistic resonance between wandering with an o and wandering with an a linking it in with your idea of um getting lost so graham specifically asked question can you comment on the philosophy of walking and zooming asked the specific question can you elaborate a little more on the connection between wander with an o wander with an a and relationality and or collaboration Okay. So Jeremy, Jeremy, do you want to kickstart that one? Yeah. So um, so first thing, interesting thing, Danny and I are working on a special issue with um, Ursula Lizowska, um right now and a number of other people, the anthropologist Shannon Lee Doughty, um, a, a number of other, um, Anders Schinkel, who writes on Wonder, Brian Onishi, uh, Magdalena, uh, um, Magdalena Woli <laughs> Lubshoi, um, and we're we're actually the, in Polish, um, wonder and wander are separated also by one word. And the title of this issue in Polish, which then has a, a uh, an English um, translation, is to wonder in parentheses to wander in corporeal relationships. So, um, uh, Graham, we, we stay tuned. This it'll be an open access journal published out of um, the University of Wrocław. Um, which has already done um, a, an open access uh, seminar on wonder in 2020. Um, so it's it, it's a you're right about this connection. Um, what I would just say really briefly is um, let me just backtrack. I know, you know we're working in many different registers here, but for those of you who know the history of philosophy, and then, then I'll come at it from a more everyday way. Um, one way to understand this book is that first of all, it's not a secondary source on Martha Nussbaum's philosophy. It's a disagreement with her that's constructive. Um, um, it's part of a relationship that's intergenerational around these kinds of issues, but it's a, actually it's an, it's an independent um, philosophical essay, I guess you would say. Secondly, one of the things it does is it takes seriously that in Nussbaum's understanding of her own work, there's a tension between Aristotelianism or new Aristotelianism and um, at times a Kantian moment in her or moral philosophy. And then even more importantly, in her cultural choices, there's an interest in, in romanticism and post-romanticism. And what I do is take seriously what for me is um, a, a, an important writer on wonder in the 1980s, Ronald Hepburn, identified a difference between a Humean and a Kantian tradition of wonder. The Humean one, which is I think mostly represented in the Anglophone world, sees wonder as an emotion that is given to flights of joy or fancy or delight. Um, there's different versions of this. It can also be ecstatic. 
the Kantian version sees that these emotional eruptions are part of a continuum which has its most ordinary form in a basic settled state of searching to understand. And the place to go look for this in Kant is not the first critique, it's the third critique in the analytic of aesthetic judgment, actually under the analysis of the beautiful. And I take extremely seriously this one moment in the analysis of the beautiful that became extremely important for the history of romanticism, German romanticism in particular, but also for English romanticism, including its poetics, it's poetry, Coleridge and so on. This one moment where um, Kant says, look, what's going on in the experience of the beautiful is that we are um, sensing that something is so pregnant with meaning that there's more there in our intuition than we can conceptualize, but we want to conceptualize it. And I think that this moment is the moment that should be occupied by the, ex basically I read it up through Schelling, and Kierkegaard, and I have a, a, a bit of a subtext diatribe against Heidegger, um, but I read, I think that this moment is actually the, the correct way to understand wonder. Um, and so just to get back to your question, what happens is, is in wonder is that broadly speaking, something doesn't fully make sense and we have to strive to make sense of it, but we do so in a way that senses that there's a pregnancy of possibilities of sense-making around the thing that we're confused about. And lostness is the life of wonder because it's the most vital moment in that dynamic process of striving where, um, where we're both confronted at the same time with the absence of sense, technically an aporia, a pathlessness in Greek. It literally means having no longer having a path to walk on. <laughs> to go back to your walking, but we're struck with that combined with the scent, with the in intuition that there is a lot of meaning or sense to be made here of something. And that precise Kantian moment is the heart of the book. And what I do is I attribute it back to Nussbaum. I mean, it's also my view, right? But I also ground it a reading of Nussbaum that says that this neo, that her neo Aristotelianism needs to leave a space for human form, which understands our particular dynamism, the way that humans are thoughtful in such a way that if we don't have wonder as a human virtue, we, um, we lose out on our flourishing. So th that, that I just wanted to give some technical stuff for the kind of philosophy heads that are on the, on the call, but Graham and Su Ming, to put it in everyday terms, um, the, the, the thing that's important if one is, is trying to practice wonder is that one has to get oneself into a position to, um, to see that the possibilities of sense and meaning around whatever it is that one is considering exceed it, um, exceed it, and 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 are um, interesting are are that that are worth following out to try to consider. So just let me let me just give one example to make this more concrete. When I wrote the book, and then then I'll stop with this answer. I had not yet discovered the literature in, in psychology between focal attention and diffuse attention. But I was reading some work by, on Simone Weil recently by Mark Fortney, who's um, a Canadian uh, philosopher. And, I, and this is, in, I, it, it literally, I say things in the book that, are, that could be mapped onto this distinction. So in focal attention, we're focusing on something we want to try to understand. Diffuse attention is a name for the space around whatever we're focusing on that we might be aware of such that we could come to a sudden insight about something that we don't understand and what we're focusing on. The basic idea behind wonder and lostness is that whatever it is we're wondering about or over is, is a focus around which there is this kind of diffuse attention. And the, the, the one addition I get from the Kantian tradition is that this diffuse attention is suffused with um, this is the positive anxiety stuff, Anthony. It's suffused with um, a pregnancy of meaning that we yet can't yet articulate. And so that's the, that's the basic idea. So if walking does that for you, um, yes, that's why Rousseau and Thoreau, I think, found walking as an embodied way of stirring the possibilities in their life and their relationship to themselves so that while they were walking, as Rousseau would say, the sentiment of his existence, that's the expression, sentiment d'existence, that sentiment of existence would um, 
allow Rousseau to see that even though his life was blasted out by domination and inequality and by the, in, the incredible kind of mental challenges he had, um, as he was walking and embodied, he could feel that there was more meaning to his life and more meaning to the world than he, um, than he had at his fingertips. And the walking allowed him to continually reflect in that way. So he was wondering by putting himself in a position so that whatever he was focusing on, there was always the sense that there was a beautiful excess of meaning that he had to process as he walked. So I think that's the way I would put it. Thank you. Um, Misty or Danielle, would either of you like to follow up on anything in that in those questions or anything Jeremy said? If I could very quickly just nod to three to three other approaches. One just riffing directly off uh, what Jeremy said about Kant's critique of judgment. So uh, there's a, a late essay of Arendt's where she uses that critique of judgment and Kant's theory of the beautiful and literally says that's where she gets her theory of, of politics and her theory of judgment. That And I think she uses the expression <clears throat> wandering around into other people. So, so she takes up that, that dynamism, that embodied dynamism. Uh, second, I just want to give a nod to my wonderful colleague, Astrida Naimanis, who runs something called Walk Shops, where instead of, you know, being in the windowless room and doing philosophy, um, it's done walking in place. And from Astrida to say, you know, we started off by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands where we where we are and on the occasions where I've had the privilege of doing philosophy, whatever that means, not a not a, a closed term with First Nations people, it's often been walking on country. It's often been this dynamic relationship of moving across and through place that is as Jeremy said, pregnant with so much more meaning and possibility than one holds when one enters into it. Uh, so I think it's something, again, that those of us who are trained in the Western philosophical tradition can learn a lot from the knowledges that have so often been excluded from the academy of doing philosophy in this much more embodied place-based way. So that's all I wanted to say to supplement Jeremy's really rich answer. Yeah, I have um, one brief thing to say um, that um, is a, from a visual sense. Um, one of the things that I uh, try to practice my own um, studio work and that I appreciate in seeing, in seeing Riva Larere's work, and I didn't articulate that, was that um, in working with visual representation, um, you can have kind of two, two processes going at the same time, which is being able to do the visual work, um, but then also to kind of let your thoughts wander, um, which is something that I, I really enjoy about working visually. Um, and so there, a lot of the time, the actual process of making the marks becomes something that I'm doing while I'm um, thinking about or um, basically wandering around and within the relationship that I'm making the work about. Um, and I know that like this, this kind of meditative um, process um, is something a lot of artists work with. And I know there's a, there's a tradition of walking um, as a performative, um, a performance art practice in, in, um, in art as well. Sorry, I keep pressing that mute button. It doesn't work. But anyway, I think it's worked now. So there's one, there's a question that I think is a really good one to um, end on from Jesse. Hello, Jesse. Thanks for joining. Um, what's the place? So, so Jesse comments on the ambiguous, also the du double-edged nature of wonder in addressing um, environmental peril. On the one hand, it instills respect for nature. On the other hand, catastrophe itself can evoke wonder. Fires and storms are wondrous. So can wonder be our compass if it also resonates to ruin? Jeremy, do you want to kick that one off? Yeah, Jesse, it's uh, so nice to see you here. And I can't wait for your book on wonder. <laughs> um, I, I, I quote your, some of your articles in, uh, in the book. 
Um, I think we, we may have disagreements, but it's really an honor that you're here. And also it's nice to see you on the other side of graduate school. Um, I, went, I, I think I went to your dissertation defense. But anyway, um, uh, the simple thing I'll just say, just to keep this, I mean, this is a long answer, but the, the, there's a long answer to this. But the simple answer is we never in the book think of wonder as some kind of sufficient condition for um, a moral response. Um, but it's on the side, um, I actually think that wonder in, understood properly and in its place is a necessary condition on moral response. So, um, so um, you're absolutely right. I mean, there, there are ways that people can have wondering attitudes, can have wondering experiences, um, and for various ways not manage to be responsible or maybe even to be vicious. Um, so, I mean, that the simple thing I'd say. And then the next very simple thing I'll say, because I would like to hear Danny and, and, and Misty, if you have anything on this, is that um, the, the reason I read the pas passage on omnicide, um, which is really, it's even hard for me to say that word. I mean, it just, it's a word that shouldn't be said, really, um, is that it becomes really obvious if you think through the passage and what it's about, that all the issues bound up in the generation of that problem plus the problem itself require a capacity of us to live with anxiety that's truly monumental and heroic. And two things the book does to try to establish some of the conditions for that capacity are first, it argues, there's a long argument I haven't gone into, and I'm sorry, Anthony, it just, it didn't come up easily today, um, for why actually anxiety as it's talked about in English is a parasitic and derivative form of anxiety, what I call negative anxiety, and that it only makes sense on the basis of a deeper positive anxiety, which I call the mind's excitement. Um, and I believe that we need to develop this capacity to hold, um, to hold possibilities of sense and meaning in order to face things like collapse. So that's the first thing. And there's a whole other line of my work that has to do with adaptation to climate change that is actually drawing on this. The second thing I do in the book, and I, I'd really love to see your own work on this, is um, I argue that wonder really needs to be understood as a practice. Um, and so that there, we need to develop multiple practices of wondering that can allow people to develop the, say, the capacity in the midst of ruin or in the midst of catastrophe to actually um, keep open to a sense of the possibilities for sense and meaning that are here. So again, necessary condition, positive anxiety, and then practices of wondering become really quite crucial for ecological crisis. Thank you. Um, Danielle, Misty, either of you want to follow up on anything in that or anything in Jesse's question? I, I do, if that's okay. I, it's a very confronting question, Jesse. And I, I came to it not so much in the moral ambivalence of wonder, but more in aesthetics. So there are there were times during the fires I remember one day when I was driving out to where the donkeys and the horses had been evacuated and I stopped on a ridge and over the mountains you could see the storm clouds the pyrocumulus clouds of the fires and it is so awesome <laughs> and so sublime in certain ways that it's difficult not to fall into an aesthetic experience of that. There's a wonderful book by an Australian writer called Signs and Wonders, where Delia Faulkner, where she also talks about the extraordinary aesthetics of these catastrophic fire, uh, uh, climate events. And as the type of moral philosopher that I am and the type of human being I am, I really resist that. And I think the way that I, again, in an embodied way, I create the resistance to it is by attending not to the event as if it's an event in itself, but the way that it is affecting beings with whom I have relationships of love. So I think that that is a way of pulling yourself back from that uh, isolated aestheticization or wonder of the catastrophic uh, event. But at the same time, I don't, 
I'm not fully satisfied with that answer. And I went to a really brilliant talk last week by a environmental lawyer called Philippa McCormack, and she was talking about fire and the way in which in the Western tradition, uh, when it comes to wildfires, not fire in itself as a creative energy, uh, we, we are so terrified of fire and we always speak about wildfires as this terrible thing. But for First Nations people in this country, they under, they were friends with fires, right? They understood that fire also has a life-giving force. And so this is something that I haven't fully worked out, but I actually think that holding that moment of wonder at the same time in tension with one's grieving, terrible, uh, mournful connection to the impacts on the bodies of, of all of the beings who we love, that we actually have to hold those two together. And that is the type of uh, growing the muscles of our capacity for anxiety that Jeremy was talking about. Thanks, Danielle. Um, Misty, would you like to pick up on anything in Jesse's question, Jeremy's response, or Danielle's response? No, I actually don't have an answer to that question, but I appreciate the question um, and Jeremy and Daniel's answers, and, and also um, just how that opens up I, I don't, what, what I want to think about after this event. So I just want to leave it as the, as the final, their answers as the final part. 